Legendary Uncle Studios, welcome to another edition of WorkCom Matters, the central location for all your employee, employer, and uh, workers' uh, compensation. <laughs> My name is Steve Appel, and I'll be with you for the next hour with some talk news and hopefully some answers about WorkCom Matters. Thanks for being part of the show, and if you break away from your WorkCom Matters, feel free to give us a call and clue us in. With your questions, comments, and or concerns, the phone number worldwide, 818-357-4120. You can be old school. Send me a fax, 818-475-1437. You can send me an email, wcexaminer at aol.com. With me in studio, the chief of staff, Dr. Mike Zima, my protege, attorney Robert Ozeron. Scott Walton of Uncle's studio is on the board. My special guest, Laura Wilson, back at Munich, Germany. John Scalia, and back at WorkCom Central, making sure the whole damn thing goes right, is Jake Paris. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of WorkCom Matters. And I've been wanting to have my guest tonight on ever since we started, and I'm just going to get right into it. She's got an associate's degree from East Los Angeles Community College, a bachelor's degree from Whittier College, and a master's degree from the University of Phoenix. For the past 15 to 20 years, she's been involved in vocational rehabilitation and is currently on anybody's top five list as the expert of choice regarding vocational rehabilitation. She is a member of the California Applicant Attorney Association, the American Board of Vocational Experts, and the International Association of Rehabilitation Professionals. She is the president of Latino Cop. She owns her own business. And she specializes in bilingual, vocational, rehabilitation, supplemental job displacement, benefit vouchers, job analysis, and vocational rehabilitation reports and providers, and Ogilvy and LaBeouf, and of course, workers' compensation trial testimony. It is my pleasure, my privilege, to welcome tonight to Work Comp Matters, Ms. Laura Wilson. Wow. Isn't that unbelievable? <laughs> that's huh? unbelievable. It, 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 Thank it, you it, so much. No, no, no. The pleasure is mine, and it is well deserved. How are you doing? What do you think of Uncle Studios? I'm doing great. Uncle Studios is incredible. And of course, you you brought your fan club with you, and uh, I'm glad we were kind of semi uh, before a live audience. Uh, the main thing is, I want you to have a great time, enjoy it, and thank you. Uh, very much for coming on. Now, the first question that I want to ask you is known as the icebreaker. I discussed it with Mike. I discussed it with Robert. But, uh, I, okay, here's the thing. Uh, we've got John Scal- uh, Scalia, who has a five-minute segment, and I agree with essentially what he paraphrased, or I'm going to paraphrase him, that you have forgotten more about vocational rehabilitation than any of us here will ever remember. But I've got a test for you. So first for Robert, when was vocational rehabilitation started? Give me a year, Robert. Oh, man, I don't know. I'm going to say the 60s. But 1960s. You asked, you asked me on the ride over, and I didn't have the answer no, no, for you, you then. You were coming me, back I didn't from look court, it up. you were stressed out. <laughs> yeah, I didn't look it up in the interim. Mike, now you and I discussed this. Well, you got to clarify, it? mandatory VR was as of 1175 in California. VR, any VR. I don't know about the prehistoric Egyptian origins of that topic, though. 
Laura Wilson, when was vocational rehabilitation first started? A very long time ago. And are you going to agree with me that it was the 17th or 18th century pirates and the pirate code? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. There we go. Okay. For all of for all of you that don't know, vocational rehabilitation was first started in the pirate code in about the 18th century, 1700s, 1800 pirates. And if you were on a pirate ship, they had the pirate's code, which said if you lost a finger, if you lost a hand, if you lost an arm, if you lost a leg, i.e. peg leg, not only would you get pieces of silver, pieces of eight, or pieces of gold, but you would also be guaranteed employment on another pirate ship should you want to do that. Am I correct? Yes, you're correct. There you go. Um So now let's bring it down to California workers' compensation. Now that we know that California workers' compensation was started at the, uh, basically when the Industrial Revolution started in 1912, 1914. Passage of the Boynton Act. Passage of the Boynton Act. However, actual voc rehab didn't become mandatory or part of the law until the 1960s. 1175. Sound about right, Laura? Yes. And then when was uh, VRMA started? Vocational Rehabilitation Maintenance Allowance. I'm assuming that was part of it It's part of the the act, I believe. Okay. And I wanted to tell a little bit of a story about the most expensive VR uh, plan that I had ever been involved Self-employment in. plan is coming. <laughs> well, well you're, Some you're, of those out of the country plans. It, actually, it's, it's out of the state. When I was an examiner, I came on to a new case, which already had the VR plan established, and the reserves were above $200,000. This guy was rehabbed to get a four-year degree at the University of Hawaii. So they put him up for his food, his expenses, his education, and the whole ball of wax was over $200,000. Because in those days, all you had to do was show an aptitude, correct? There were no limits on how much the plan could cost if it was deemed reasonable by the rehab person at the VRB or whatever. Correct. I mean, you could even become an airline pilot and then rehabilitate yourself again. And what California politicians and the people in charge realized eventually uh, coming into, what, 1990, the early 2000s, is that more than 50% of the injured workers that were put into rehab plans and arguably successfully rehabbed into something else, they eventually went back to doing their pre-injury job. So arguably, waste of time, waste of money. Am I right? No. Oh, well, please correct me. That is why you're here. You're the expert. It's very important for a person to go through vocational rehabilitation because it improves the quality of their life. We are able to put them back out into the open labor market, which is the ultimate goal of any rehabilitation counselor. Uh, now, of course, my name is Steve Appel. You're listening to Work Comp Matters. Uh, my special guest is vocational rehabilitation extraordinaire Laura Wilson. We are brought to you by A1 Law Santa Monica Tickets and ABC Rugs. Um, let me ask you a question. Uh, what's the most expensive rehab plan that you've ever been involved with? Mm, probably one that was out of the country where it was a plan that we went to Guatemala and helped a person create a cattle ranch. And it was probably, I want to say, probably about 16,000 or more. Did it end up being successful? Yes. He still has his cattle ranch to this day. That's amazing. Now, are rehab plans these days allowed to be perfected by you out of the country? No. After the whole vocational rehabilitation went out the window and the supplemental job displacement training voucher began, that's no longer in place. However, now we have a $6,000 voucher, which does not go into the injured worker's pocket, but it goes into the QRR as well as training. But the state is going to pay 
I think a five thousand dollar dollar check to the injured worker. And the only thing that's required is one percent permanent disability. Is that correct? You're correct. And so it doesn't matter. We don't need a doctor to say that they are a qualified injured worker. We just need 1% permanent the disability. Only, one of the things that is required that's very, very important is they need to have a signed proof of service that it with the voucher. Because if they don't have a voucher along with the signed proof of service, they will not receive the $5,000. Now, how early, middle, or late do you get involved in the injured worker's case? On cases um, after 2013, the moment the client is PNS'd, on cases before 2013, um, on cases that have been settled, um, CNR or stipulated. And your clients, uh, mostly applicant oriented or defense oriented, who retains your services or is it equal? It depends on what you're asking. Um, when we're discussing the voucher, a lot of it, in most of it, the majority would be applicant. When it, you were discussing any sort of vocational expert reports, it would be applicant and defense. And what's, what's your secret about uh, having your own business? I, did you ever see the George Clooney movie, Up in the Air? He, he fires people for a living. Yes. And um, do you agree? Well, well, let me ask you this. Did you start your own business because you went to work for a company or a corporation and then for whatever reason you were sort of weeded out and then you just started your own business or from the time you were in school you knew you wanted to hang your own shingle? No, actually um, from the time I started vocational rehabilitation when I was working for Hayashi and Associates, I literally sat at the table with many of the vocational rehabilitation counselors that I have the utmost respect for to this day, um, and literally sat at the table with them and told them, I'm only doing this till I get through school. Um, and what, what were you planning to do after you got through school I at actually, that time? I actually thought maybe I would do, um, I would become like a child development um child development right. life specialist and deal within within with children that have um, terminal, terminally ill children and deal within music therapy. However, um, I went to work, I was in college. Um, I needed to earn some money because I'm a single mom of a special needs child that has cerebral palsy and attention deficit and autism. And as I said, as a single mom, and I really, I just, it was just something I needed to do. I even actually tried law school for about a year and a half. But working on torts and doing briefs and sitting on the floor, doing um, preparing for law school just wasn't wasn't made for me. Um, I then um, joined. Um, I then went and worked for an applicant attorney, which I will not mention his name. Um, however, it was a lesson learned. I saw what applicants really go through. Um, and what they need, what they, what they go through when they're sitting there in the waiting room. I saw what happens when they go to a doctor's office, um, then you know, are given medication or have to go through um, um, lots of different treatments. I saw a lot of different things that occurred. I then called my aunt Ana Mancia, who at the time was working for Hayashi and Associates, and I just kind of explained to her that I really need to do something different. This just isn't made for me. I'm not made to be the receptionist or the secretary. Um, she then said, well, you have your BA. Um, why don't you go ahead and join us at Hayashi? So I joined Hayashi and Associates, learned all about vocational rehabilitation, and then all of a sudden, the voucher reform occurred. And I had no choice but to kind of pick up on my own, and then I joined, a, I had a business partnership that just didn't work out. Um, blessing in disguise, I was then able to go ahead and start my own company, which I love, and um, been going and blooming ever since then. Was your parting with Hayashi and Associates agreeable, or was it contentious? Um, with Hayashi and Associates, it was agreeable because at the time, what basically happened is we knew vocational rehabilitation and the need of counselors and the old vocational rehab plans 
um, were no longer going to be needed. So basically, at the time, a lot of the counselors were going ahead and, you know, looking for other things to do at the time. Um, many of the counselors that I knew at the time, some of them were real estate. I'm still involved and still in touch with many of them, which, like I said before, just because of the Voc Rehab and the, fo- the fight we had for the Voc Rehab, I have um, a lot of respect for those Voc Rehab counselors. Um, where they didn't just wake up one morning and decide to become a voucher counselor. Um, we went through the we went through the works. We jumped through hoops for these clients. We did the informal conferences. We did the formal conferences. We did the JAs. We did all of that fun stuff, you know, in order to become a counselor. And we did the out-of-state clients. We did the out-of-the-country clients and stuff like that. That is all excellent information. I want to ask you some more questions uh, specifically about communication with clients and, of course, LaBeouf. But uh, we've got to pay a couple of bills. My name is Steve Appel. You're listening to Work Comp Matters. We're brought to you by A1 Law, Santa Monica Tickets, and ABC Rugs. If you want the number one computer management system used by more workers' compensation attorneys than any other system in the damn Kuiper Belt, give me a call. A1835. 4120 for your no strings attached money back guarantee one dollar a day a1 law and if you want those hard to get concert sports theater tickets front row heck it don't matter give our buddy brian a call santa monica tickets 310-395-8587 and now for our newest sponsor here's a little something about abc rugs ABC Rugs has been in the business of manufacturing and direct importation and exportation of Persian and Oriental rugs for more than 39 years. ABC Rugs is a direct importer and wholesaler of antique, Moroccan, Oriental, and Persian rugs. Established in 1978, ABC Rugs is definitely old school. 323-897-5444. That's ABC Rugs. 323-897-5444. And uh, we're back on Work Comp Matters. We're going to get back to our special guest, Voc Rehab Extraordinaire, Laura Wilson. But we've got some news uh, for the first news story of the night. He's my right-hand man. He's also the chief of staff. He <laughs> kept me in check and hopefully out of trouble at least 90% of the time with the first news story of the night, Dr. Michael Zima. Thank you, Steve. An Aeromexico jetliner crashed while taking off during a severe storm in northern Mexico on Tuesday, smacking down in a field nearly intact, then catching fire. But officials said everyone on board escaped alive. Governor Jose Aispuro, who had initially reported there were no death, deaths, but later said authorities were searching the charred Embraer 190 to make sure, announced late Tuesday that no person has died. He said the pilot and one other person were in serious condition, but stable. Earlier, he said a total of 49 folks had been taken to hospitals, and officials said most had minor injuries. Folks, that's a remarkable story. That airplane fell out of the air. Well, don't they say that any landing you can walk away from is a good landing? I don't. I don't think it's that literal. When your plane catches well, fire, I'm not on saying the way it's out. literal. I'm just saying, don't they say that? Yeah. Well, listen, <laughs> they survived. Thank God. You know, let's, but hopefully not again. Really remarkable story. Though. Yeah. Yeah. A yeah. federal judge yesterday blocked the online release of blueprints for making a gun on a 3D printer. This came after Attorney General from eight states and a District of Columbia filed suit against the Trump administration, which had opened the door for the release of these blueprints by settling a recent case. Washington State's Attorney General Bob Ferguson was pleased with the judge's ruling. House Speaker Paul Ryan got a surprise when he was filming an episode of Finding Your Roots, the TV show in which Harvard scholar Henry Louis Gates Jr. helps people explore their ancestry, the Associated Press reports. Gates told the Television Critics Association on Tuesday, that's yesterday, that he traced Ryan's heritage to his 10th great-grandfather, who was born in 1531. The research shows Ryan is 3% Ashkenazi Jewish, Gates said. And now, with the next news story, for the very first time, 
Ms. Laura Wilson. A new survey from Rehab Facility Archstone Recovery Center found that when people log on to Amazon while hitting the sauce, they can incur a financial hangover as well. Okay, stop right there. Laura, firstly, I want to know, do you ever shop on Amazon? Yes, I do. And do you ever shop on Amazon when you've had some of the sauce? You you know what? You don't have to say. Keep reading the news story. (laughs) The amount, pe- the amount people spent tended to vary based on their preferred type of alcohol. Gin drinkers tend to splurge the most, spending the average of more than $82. Even whiskey drinkers, the most frugal group when classified by the type of alcohol, wound up spending almost $40. Half the whiskey drinkers that I know don't even know the difference between whiskey and bourbon. Beer drinkers were the only other group to spend less than $40, and the people drinking red or white wine spent about $42 to $46, respectively. Laura, you did that so well. Boss, why don't you you teach us the difference right now? What is it? I don't drink. (laughs) I'd I'd, I'd be more than happy to. I could see maybe, you know, after you've had a couple glasses of wine, that maybe you would go ahead and make a couple more purchases than normal yes in fact i know a lot of shops i mean if you go into beverly hills they're not only going to bring you out some wine or some champagne they're going to bring you out some sexy women dressed in scantily clad clothes and say uh, buy this right you never know but to answer robert's question if i'm not mistaken whiskey is 100 percent corn whereas uh, bourbon is 51% corn, and then the remainder is a variety of uh, different uh, uh, vegetables that are um, uh, distilled. I I wouldn't know to correct you, but that sounds right. Well, I'm a tequila drinker myself, so that's why I said, you know. I think uh, Mike has the next news story. Oh, okay. I was going to say, I'm a... Oh, you wanted to talk more about alcohol distilling? Well, I'm just going to (laughs) say... But I'm a Budweiser guy, but I always say yeah, it. I absolutely. think that makes me a redneck, but yeah. I'm not sure. i got to ask Jeff Foxworthy or something. Yeah, there you go. The toll of devastation from one of the most brutal fires in California history rose Wednesday to more than 1,000 homes destroyed and almost 200 damaged as a sprawling wildfire ignited by a spark from a towed vehicle grew to 180 square miles. Blistering heat, shifting wind, steep terrain, and plentiful dried growth continued to challenge more than 4,000 firefighters battling the car fire, which has killed six people, including two firefighters. Quote from Cal Fire, the western edge of of the fire continued to challenge crews yesterday evenings. Crews will continue to construct control lines and contingency lines to mitigate further spread, end quote from Cal Fire. The fire has burned an area four times the size of San Francisco. The 1,018 homes, 12 businesses, and 435 other buildings that have been confirmed as destroyed placed the blaze sixth on the state's list of most destructive fires. Shasta County Sheriff Tom Bosenko said all missing people reported to his office had been accounted for, but he said the death toll could rise. And we've got uh, more news uh, coming up later, but right now it's uh, we're still with our special guest, Voke Rehab Extraordinaire, uh, Laura Wilson. So I want to ask you a question. Uh, your communications with the injured worker, are they privileged in, anywhere, in any way or are they totally discoverable? Have you ever had an injured worker say, well, you know what, I want to tell you something, don't tell anybody else? Have you ever had a demand for your records? I have had demand for my, res- for my records. Have you ever redacted anything as privileged? No. Now, here's the question I've been waiting to ask you, and I know my protege wants to hear the answer to this. Now, Robert's been an applicant's attorney now for about five and a half, six years, and Robert knows what LaBeouf is. But some of our injured, uh, some of our listeners may not know what LaBeouf is. That's when we have an injured worker presumably into the life pension, at least uh, 70 percent, but it doesn't have to be. We send the injured worker to you, and even though the medical evidence from the AME or the QME says that, well, he's only, the applicant is only disabled for 70% of the time, you issue a report, at least if it's referred by an applicant attorney, saying, you know what, regardless of the medical evidence, this guy, because of his prior education, his prior disability, his or whatever, 
cannot find a job. Talk to me about LaBeouf. Do you mostly represent injured workers for LaBeouf, or do you also represent defendants when the defendants want you to issue a report saying the applicant can work? I know it's a long-winded question, but I'm going to put my mic aside, and I'm going to let you have the next couple of minutes. Um, it varies on who requests the referral. Um, if an applicant attorney calls and says, you know, Ms. Wilson, I'd like you to go ahead and meet with my client regarding a vocational evaluation, then we'll go ahead and do it. If defense calls us and requests us, then we'll go ahead and proceed forward with the evaluation. Although um, we, let's say an applicant attorney requests for a referral, requests for us to meet with a client for a vocational evaluation, if once we meet with the client, and the client is not 100%, we will, let the, we will go ahead and let all parties know that the client is not 100%. Now, what do you take into consideration to make that determination whether or not the client is 100%? Um, we, take, we take in, into consideration um, the medical reports, and then also um, there's a software that we use. It's the McCroskey software. I've never heard of that. What is the McCroskey software? The McCroskey software is a software that's used throughout the United States by um, different vocational experts. Um, and so it, it's it's AMA uh, uh, it's AMA based. Yes. Okay. Um, it's also used um, by Social Security experts as well. And what it does is it determines what jobs are available out within the open labor market for a client to do, taking into consideration the client's restrictions. You know, I'm so glad you mentioned Social Security because the standards for Social Security to be disabled are different than workers' comp. And in my experience, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's a lot easier to be considered permanently totally disabled by social security than workers comp is that correct yes and that's something actually that i com- that i explain to the clients when they come in because many of the clients when they do come in they say but miss wilson i've already qualified for social security and i explain to them social security and workers comp it's like apples and oranges um the requirements for social security are much the requirements for workers comp are much stringent All good information, and we thank you very much. My name is Steve Appel. You're listening to my special guest, Laura Wilson, vocational rehabilitation rehabilitation on Work Comp Matters. We're brought to you by A1 Law and Santa Monica Tickets and ABC Rugs. If you want the number one computer management system used by more workers' compensation attorneys than any other computer system on the planet, give me a call, 818-357-4120. For your no-strings-attached money-back guarantee, $1 a day, A1 Law. And if you want those hard-to-get sold out, yes, even front row, concerts, sports, theater tickets, give our buddy Brian a call at Santa Monica Tickets, 310-395-8587. Uh, we've got more talk, more news, hopefully some answers uh, also from our guest, Laura Wilson. Uh, but it's time uh, for John Scalia's segment. I know that one of the contributing factors why Laura was kind enough to grace us with her time is because attorney John Scalia kept hounding her and hounding her and hounding her to come in and and uh, be on the show. And I really, really appreciate that. Laura's nodding her head, and that's great. I totally agree. (laughs) (laughs) So without further ado, he's a 45-year workers' compensation attorney. He's still got his ticket to practice law in California, but he's hanging out in Munich, Germany. Lucky him. There you go. And with his segment on Laura Wilson, attorney John Scalia. Hi, this is John from Munich with the Work Comp International Report. Steve's guest this week is Laura Wilson. I have two comments about that. First, Laura's a lot easier to look at than I am. And second, Laura knows more than I ever did or ever will know about rehabilitation. So you should listen to her. The fact that I don't know nearly as much as Laura does not mean I don't have stories. Even though I stopped actively participating in the rehab process long before the rules were changed, I have two stories. On one, I represented the injured worker. On the other, I represented Delta Airlines. The first story involved an injured worker whose rehab was being denied by the carrier. 
At the hearing, I managed to convince the insurance company representative that their position was not sustainable, and she agreed to pay two years of back temporary disability benefits to my client. I had been very clear to my client that she was not to talk and that she was not to say anything until after all agreements had been signed, sealed, and delivered, or at least signed. Sure enough, the agreement's about to be signed. She's about to get two years of back TD, and she says, I am so glad I'm signing this now just before I leave California. The insurance company representative snatched the papers from her. I looked at her and said, not only are you not getting two years of temporary disability, but you're going to get a new lawyer. And I went to the hearing officer and said, I'm out of here. The judge might not let me out, but he did. I also represented her husband. And I thought, oh, for sure he's going to sub me out once he finds out what I did to his wife. He did not. I ended up settling his case for a fair amount of money. The second story is I represented Delta Airlines in a case involving a ticket agent. The ticket agent had worked for Delta for almost 20 years. As a ticket agent, she only had a high school education, but she had worked there so long that she was earning a substantial income. She was placed into a rehab program, and she was almost through the rehab program when she said, this is too physically difficult for me. Well, we knew it wasn't. The real reason was that she was about to be put into a job that would pay her half of what she was used to earning, and she clearly did not want that. However, she had had four knee surgeries. So I called my client in Atlanta, and I said, look, we both know that the applicant is refusing to continue with rehab because she sees what the economic result is going to be. However, she's had four knee surgeries, and since there is a medical report saying she's 100% disabled, guess what the judge is going to do? Fortunately for us, the applicant is represented by a very competent attorney. She was represented by Sherry Grant, and Sherry had filed a subsequent injuries fund complaint. As a result of that, Delta Airlines, my client, and I were able to stipulate to 100% disability, of which 67% was payable by Delta, and the rest by the subsequent injuries fund. That meant that my client did not have to pay a life pension. So, just goes to show you to watch out for that when you have a case involving a life pension and or rehab. Now, I'm going to tell a story about Harry Truman. Harry Truman, you say, John? Why would you tell a story about him? Certainly, he was not a socialist. Well, not so fast there. Harry Truman, in 1945, proposed a full employment act for the United States of America. The original draft of the legislation said, All Americans able to work and seeking work have the right to useful, remunerative, regular, and full-time employment, and it is the policy of the United States to assure the existence at all times of sufficient employment opportunities to enable all Americans who have finished their schooling and who do not have full-time housekeeping responsibilities to freely exercise this right. Well, aside from the sexist language of the times, you will see that that is an attempt by the Harry Truman to have the United States government guarantee every American the right to a job. What a concept. America was the richest country in the world at the time, and if it's still not the richest, it's certainly one of them. And I think Harry was right. Well, that's The View from Munich this week. And John, I thank you very much, as always. It's great to have you on the show. My name is Steve Appel. You're listening to WorkCom Matters. It's time for a musical break. He's La Familia. He's Glenn Lachlan. He's the Cherry Blue Storms. And baby, he's a rich man. How does it feel to be one of the beautiful people? Now that you know who you are, what do you want to be? And have you traveled very far? i 
Storms with uh, Baby, You're a Rich Man. My name is Steve Appel. You're listening to Work Out Matters. We're brought to you by A1 Law, Santa Monica Tickets, and ABC Rugs. We're with my special guest, vocational rehabilitation extraordinaire, Laura Wilson. But it's time for the news. And uh, with, uh, I guess, the uh, continuing news story, Mr. Mike Zima. It's the Bon Appetit section of the <laughs> news A Chipotle restaurant in Ohio reopened Tuesday as officials investigate reports of illnesses linked to the location. Chipotle, which has yet to fully recover from a series of food scares in late 2015 that sent its sales plunging, said it closed the store in Powell, Ohio, on Monday to be cautious and is cooperating with authorities. It said it implemented its food safety response protocols, which include replacing the food and cleaning the restaurant. Yeah, I would think that's a good idea. Well, you know, yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, Avocado National Day or whatever in Chipotle and advertised that they were giving away uh, free guacamole with anybody that ordered a burrito. It seems like Chipotle is always having these food safety issues. I mean, repeatedly. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what to say. Uh, with the second uh, news story out of the break, uh, my protege attorney Robert Ozeron. All right. <clears throat> a popular motorized scooter sharing startup dropped at least 50 of its two-wheeled vehicles on the Balboa Peninsula over the weekend. But according to the city, the company did so without giving notice or getting a permit. And residents promptly complained about the dockless electric scooters being left on the sidewalk. One of Birds, the company's name, key features is that riders can pick up and leave the scooters anywhere. Quote, we sent Bird a demand to remove all of their scooters from the city by midnight yesterday. Otherwise, they face the possibility of criminal prosecution and or administrative citation. Assistant City Attorney Michael Torres said Tuesday. This is becoming a huge issue in Southern California. I don't think it's that big in Central or Northern California, but they're talking about these motorized scooters. They're not supposed to be used on the sidewalk. They're supposed to be used like in special lanes or on the street. But if you're going to put them in the same lane as a car, you have no protection whatsoever. uh, Someone is going to get killed with one of these scooters. Well, yeah, right now they're just talking about how they're leaving them everywhere. Um, I don't know if you guys have actually seen them on problem. the streets. Yeah, no. yeah, they're everywhere. You, what, what do they look like? I've never seen one. I'm, it's oh, a scooter. I'm an it looks like someone left a scooter unattended on the street, except it's always standing upright. So they're it fungible. Fall. You you leave one and then go get another one. I've never actually got on the scooter. I just Wait, walked so, right past it. I mean, is that what it. people do? Yeah, I think there's a credit card slot. You just slide, you just slide it right in, and then it bills oh, your credit card. It. And then yeah, now you can roll around. I see. What would happen if I was hit by one of those scooters? And really, they're not, they're not going very fast, but it'd be the person probably who's driving it who's responsible. Um, of course, I don't know. Bird, uh, anybody get their hand on any credit card, they can get it. I've always wondered why they don't just pick them up and like scrap metal them, right? There's a lot of people who you presume would want to do that, 
Uh, I mean, hell, we were talking about how my car got vandalized recently. You know, how long is how long have these things been around though? Uh, you know, I don't really know, but I've really started to notice them a lot more in the last like four or five months. Where? What well, city? Newport Beach, down there in the OC area, Balboa Peninsula, that's one. Uh, right here in the valley on, on uh, Ventura Boulevard, if you go like uh, Laurel Canyon, uh, between Coldwater and the Laurel Canyon on Ventura Boulevard, you'll, you'll see some for sure. Uh, Hollywood, there's a lot. Santa Monica? Santa Monica, there's a lot. Uh, actually, you go down to like Third Street Promenade, that's pretty much the epicenter. That's their home. Uh, so there's a lot there. You know, there's a study coming up that I wanted to read and get Laura's take on. According to a study published in the journal Psychological Science, 40% of people have a first memory that is fictional. It is widely accepted among scientists that people's earliest memories tend to date from roughly three to three and a half years old. However, 38 to 39 percent of the 6,650 people studied participating claim to have memories from the age of two or younger. I know that my first memory was when I was four and a half because I remember that I was sitting, I was standing beside my mother who was ready, waiting to go out and she was pregnant with my bro- my younger brother who's five years younger than me. Therefore, my first memory was about when I was four and a half years old. Um, my how, fir- how old's your first memory? I want to say about four, four and a half. I was in preschool and I remember my parents picking me up and taking me out to the car and they said they had a surprise for me, and it was this little the puppy. The stork dropped off so, something, a gift no, for you. No, actually, it was a little Samoyan before they, a little Samoyan puppy before they dropped the bomb that I um, had a little sister coming on the way. That's that's wonderful. And, and do you and your little sister still get along? Yes. Oh, uh, that's great. Now, there's also something that I wanted to ask you. You have brought some of your colleagues, your employees, your associates here, and I wanted to, if it's okay, invite them up to the round table, and I wanted to ask them what Laura is like during regular work hours. So come on up. We, d- we don't have microphones. This is like total... Uh, just right off the cuff moment. So step up to the mic. And Laura, why don't you introduce your, your colleague that's here? What's her name, please? Um, this is Cora Lopez, and she works in my voucher department. We have She's worked with me for probably about four years now. And uh, Laura, what's it like? Oh, oh uh, Cora Lopez, Cora right? Lopez. Yes. Cora, what is it like working for Laura? Oh, it's great. I love it there. I now, love is she, is she a micromanager where she stands over your shoulder and tells you everything that you're doing right or wrong? Or is she more like a laissez-faire boss, come and go as you please, as long as you do the work, everybody's happy? She's not, my, not into micromanagement, but she is very stern as to what she does want, uh, how she wants us to handle her cases. So she is very stern in that aspect, but she's she's very cool too you know she's 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 very down to earth and she's a really great boss to work with and cora what are her standing orders for how she wants you to work well her clients her clients she wants us to treat them with utmost respect and to um, make sure that we get um, on the ball with whatever they they need how long do you have to return a call 24 48 or 72 hours we need to we need to return those calls within 24 hours okay Mm -hmm. and i presume even if you're busy or on the road at least they get a call back saying i'm returning your call but i'm busy let me schedule an appointment right absolutely Mm -hmm. and uh, let me ask you something are uh, telephone conferences with clients just as effective as in office cl- as in office appointments. I, yes. I think they are. Yes, they are. Yes, Excellent. They are. Well, mm-hmm. thank you for coming up to the round table. You're welcome. We have My your pleasure. other colleague who is listening right now and we're going to bring her up and she is absolutely just as gorgeous as the other one. And what is what is this uh, young lady's first name, please? Her name is Nani. And Nani, tell us about your experiences uh, with Laura. Do you enjoy working with her? What do you do? Oh, I, and I love working with her. I'm her marketer. Let, let, let's see if we can bring that uh, microphone a little closer, please. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, that, there you go. Get a little comfy. It's okay. Hi, I'm Nani Mata. Hello. Hi, I'm her marketer. I go out in the field and make sure our clients are happy 
with our services. What would it take for you to market uh, Work Comp Matters in Uncle's studio? She's thinking about it. Yeah, I have to think about that. <laughs> we, she has to know the product she's working with. <laughs> that there. is so st- true. She's probably still getting used to it. Okay, well, you let's... You can't really spring that on thank her, Thank you, maybe. Robert. No thank pro- you, Sammy. There you no go. No problem. Okay. Well, let's, let's, let's go more on, on the guests. So tell us about uh, uh, Laura. How do you, how do you market uh, Laura's services? Oh, it's so easy. Everybody knows her out there and knows her profession, knows how professional she is. So it's so easy for me to go out there. Um, and for the new uh, clients, they love us. They love us because we're bilingual and um, we care for our patients. We care for the injured workers. We're out there to help them out in every which way we can. I, I find that servicing the clients, returning the calls on a timely basis, and like you just said, showing that you care goes so far more than money could could ever pay for 100 percent and uh, of course i couldn't agree more my name is steve appell you're listening to work comp matters our special guest is laura wilson vocational rehabilitation extraordinaire we're brought to you by abc rugs santa monica tickets and of course a one law we've got our last musical break and then we will be back after the folk rock sounds of susan scheller one two three
Folk rock sounds of Susan Scheller on Work Com Matters. My name is Steve Appel. We're uh, here with our special guest, Laura Wilson, vocational rehabilitation expert. And of course, when our guest has a request, we're going to honor that request with the next news story of the night, Ms. Laura Wilson. Well, with all the heat happening, Stanford University issued a new study indicating warming climates definitely affect the mental health and contributes to suicide rates. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Uber is facing a United States governmental investigation into allegations that the ride-hailing service set up a pay structure that discriminated against its female workers. Imagine that. According to anonymous sources, the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission opened the probe in August 2017. The House of Representatives yeah. passed a measure to reauthorize the nation's flood insurance program for four months beyond its current July 31st expiration date. The House measure to renew the national flood insurance program until November 30, 2018 contains no reforms. Assault weapons registered in California have increased by 43% under the new law that expanded the types of firearms gun owners must log with the state. Californians have applied to register 68,848 additional assault weapons in the last 11 months to comply with the state law enacted following the 2015 mass shooting in San Bernardino. The 2016 law banned sales of semi-automatic assault rifles equipped with but, uh, bullet buttons, which have detachable magazines that enable quick replacement of ammunition and require old ones to be registered with the California Department of Justice by the end of June. Laura, we, we've talked on this show many times about the Me Too movement, and I know that you are a member of WOW, uh, Women uh, in Workers' Compensation. I, I wanted to ask you, um, how do you feel that it's been more difficult for you to succeed in workers' compensation because you're a woman or that you've put in your hard work, your blood, your sweat, you've hung, you've hung your own shingle, that you do not believe that. Well, what, what's your take on, do women, you're, you're shying away from me. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I know it's kind of a sensitive subject, but it's a, okay, look, uh, I'm a feminist. I, without question, believe same, women deserve the same amount of pay for the same amount of work put in, and and I am a true feminist, but is there still some inequity there? There is. There and, is. And how do you combat that? Um, you really just have to be able to demonstrate your prof professionalism, um, that you know the skill. You have to also demonstrate the fact that you care for the clients that are out there, whether they're defense, whether they're applicant. Um, I think with me, a lot of times it's just in our office, we do a lot of handholding for the client. So I think that makes a really big difference. And as well as handholding with attorneys. Um, you just really have to, it's kind of like one of those things. Um, you have to be out there. You have to make people aware that you exist. You have to make sure, you have to make people aware that you're out there supporting the workers' comp system, that you're out there to empower the injured worker, um, to, make sh to empower workers' compensation, to make sure the right uh, for workers' composition continues to exist. Um, as we all know, the reforms that have happened have affected each and every one of us. Um, I was one of those people that was in Sacramento fighting um, for this to occur. 
Um, Tell me more what it's like to be in I the was, political atmosphere um, of Sacramento. I was actually in Sacramento. I actually hit some of those obvi- some of those offices as a lobbyist, um, and listened to many of them say, "Oh yes, yes, we're t- in total agreement. SB eight six three. We're total agreement that the injured worker needs." And then when you walked away, did they screw you behind uh, your back? Walked away. By the time I was back in the city of Whittier, California, we received a phone call and told us, "Guess what?" Um, you're done. Now, is that because you didn't put enough zeros on the check or what? Um, I don't know. I mean, I heard, uh, from what I heard, um, there were some closed door conversations. Um, I'm not really sure because I There's wasn't there. There's always closed door, smoke filled room conversations. I don't think you're ever going to be able to put enough zeros like the insurance company. Oh, I don't. Will. I, okay, yeah, so I don't, don't so. even try to exactly. get in that fight. I totally agree with you, Robert. All right. You can only win the, the, the will of the people. Exactly. I just you. feel bad because I think the hardest thing is that a lot of us put our time and energy out there um, and showed how important it was for the injured worker to get the support, to get the benefit. Um, I know the main goal is to get the injured worker out there back into the open labor market, to get them the medical treatment. The one thing I've seen since the reform is more and more of my, more and more of the clients that are coming in to see me have maybe been cut off of their medication. So they have nowhere to go. They've been cut off of a lot of things where I have people that maybe have been like on, they're on Norco, Soma, Hydrocodone, Oxycodone. I was was going to say opioids, which of course is a huge issue. Exactly. And all of a sudden they've been just cut off, like cut off at the knees basically. And all, and they're being told, well, Well, wait a minute. What do you do for them in that situation? I can't do anything because I'm a vocational counselor. I mean, I can let the applicant attorney know, but that's kind of up to the applicant attorney. What I can do, though, is in the report indicate, you know, at the time of the injury or since this time to this time, this is what the client's been taking now at the present time, you know, but all of those things, it affects everything in a whole, you know? I mean, how are you going to expect a person to recover when they're having to go through multiple, multiple multiple circuses in order to get some sort of treatment. Now, I know when you issue your report, uh, and presumably it's for the applicant, that the defense has the opportunity to get their own voc rehab report, but does the defense ever choose to uh, take your deposition? Yes, they do. And and when what, and obviously they're uh, trying to uh, lessen the impact of your report. What type of questions uh, do you get asked to, I presume, discredit the opinions in your report. Um, they'll ask me if the client has is has participated in any sort of training or has worked a different job, ha- worked a different type of job since the injury. Um, let's say you have a client that, you know, is um, monolingual. Let's say you have a client that has all those, all the different um, limitations that came with the injury? Am I considering that or am I considering other, you know, other sources that may have come in? Am I considering anything that may be non-industrial? Um, they really don't ask. One of the main questions they don't ask is how, and which is one of the main things that I found it even in defense rebuttal reports, in which I respect all experts, all vocational experts. If you've made it all the way up there, you're awesome. You're amazing. Cause it's, 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 it's an adventure. Um, the one thing they don't ask is how these medications affect a, a person's ability to be able to get up out of bed, be able to get dressed, be able to go to work, be able to concentrate, be able to not only get out of bed and do this, but do this five days a week, eight hours a day, or even four hours a day, along with now all the medication, not only the medication, but along with the physical elements and along with the emotional stuff going on. You know what, Laura, there's so many other questions that I want to ask you, but we're about out of time. I got one question left. Uh, With the legalization of marijuana in California, and not necessarily THC for the hypnotic effect, but the cannabinoids, uh, the CBDs or whatnot, the the ingredient in, in in cannabis that lessens pain. What have you encountered regarding the CBDs and cannabis in vocational rehabilitation and medicines? I found that it's more common now when I ask the clients regarding medication. Uh, are the insurance companies paying for it yet? I would assume no. No. Okay, but you find that they're taking them on their own. I find that they're taking it on their own. 
Um, but the other thing is it's hard. I mean, once they go ahead and they let me know that they're taking it on their own, let's say I find a job that may be available for them. However, if the job requires drug testing, that's something they're going to have to be upfront about. And it's something that may potentially decrease their chances of getting that job. I think that is absolutely perfect. And it's a great way to close the show. I really appreciate you Maybe coming on. I know your time Her is number? valuable. Thank you very much. Laura, if you wish, please give the listeners your information on how they can ta- contact you. Phone, email, carrier pigeon, whatever the case uh, may be. You can reach us. Um, our telephone number is 562-458-SJDB, which is 562-458-7532. You can also reach us at www.lmw at lauramwilson.com. And there you <laughs> go. Another edition of Work Comp I Matters. I messed up, though. No, you didn't mess up. You got, oh, you want to correct it? Yeah, go let ahead. me correct no, no, that. Go I'm ahead. so go sorry. It's, no, it's okay. The email, that you, our website would be www.lauramwilson.com. My email would be lmw at lauramwilson.com. We look forward to hearing from you, and we look forward to helping any injured worker out there with any sort of situation that they may have. For my right-hand man and the chief of staff, Dr. Michael Zima. For my protege, attorney Robert Ozeron. For Uncle Studio, Scott Walton on the board. For attorney John Scalia. And for all the good people uh, back at WorkComp Central who continue to support and approve of this valuable project, including but not limited to Mr. Lee File and Jake Paris, my name is Steve Appel. We'll see you again next week for another edition of WorkComp Matters!